So next is the panel discussion on, uh, we had a glimpse of what the future of skilling looks like, but we can go a lot more in detail and discuss, learn from industry experts, academicians and understand what, how do we prepare our students for the future. Okay. May I now request the panelists for this session on skilling the Indian youth for the 21st century to come onto the dais. Mr. Yogesh Handley is the co-founder of InSquare and board member of School of Inspired Leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause for all the wonderful panelists who have agreed to be with us today and share their insights. Mr. V. Ramesh, Head of Skilling, CSR at Bajaj Auto. Mr. Suresh Narasimha, Founder, Co-Create Ventures. Ms. Nirmala Raghavan, CEO and Director of Pedagogy, NRITT, and Member, Education Council, Wheels Global. Professor Kannan Modgalia, Principal Investigator of the Spoken Tutorial and FOSSI Projects at IIT Bombay. This session will be moderated by Mr. Anil Sasi, National Business Editor, The Indian Express. So, you know, just to just to get it going, I mean, there is there is uh, no denying the fact that scaling and scaling at scale is perhaps the one of the biggest challenge, if not the foremost challenge that our country faces at this point in time. And uh, you know, in this room, I don't need to uh, talk about it, delve on it. Um, and and the and the more important thing is that this scaling deficit has probably to be bridged over a short span of time, a window of something like 30 years, maybe two decades, some would say, uh, and that window is closing fast. Um, you know, and, and whether we manage to do it would mean the difference between whether India ends up as a, uh, a middle-income nation or do we, uh, you know, do we reach uh, high-income uh, status, uh, you know, as countries in Western Europe, you know the Americas. I mean that that really the skilling uh, deficit and gapping that is is essentially what would perhaps make the difference. Uh, the deeper problem is the education system. A lot has been said about it, uh, and as uh, Kanan sir would uh, testify, the bigger problem is also the obsolete curriculum that uh, that that is being followed across some of the educational institutions. And that's where I think the spoken tutorial comes in, and it's great to see. All of you keeping the flame alive, the flame going, and uh, you know, in in that context, um, and especially with the backdrop of AI, uh, you know, looming uh, uh, over all of us, I, you know, it's 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 good to you know start get this session going. We have a great panel. I'll just briefly introduce everybody, and then we can maybe start with with questions and comments. Uh, Mr. Yogesh Andle uh, is an entrepreneur. He's one of the promoters of nuclear software. He was from IIT Delhi. He's a co-founder of Inspire and a board member of uh, uh, Soil, a school of inspired leadership. Uh, where, as I was told, uh, you know, compassion, empathy are uh, you know part of the course list, which 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 is something very rare in uh, in a in a higher education uh, institution. Mr. R v Ramesh, um, you've all seen his presentation, uh, head of skilling and CSR at uh, Bajaj. Uh, Mr. Suresh Narsima, he's of uh, Co-Create Ventures. It's a, it's a turnaround VC fund uh, that focuses uh, on investing capital management capabilities in, in essentially turning around businesses, uh, you know, a, a, a alongside setting them up. He, uh, some of the businesses that, uh, that uh, they floated include um, Just Books, which is an extensive network of libraries, and uh, Bonhomia World, which is a coffee venture. He's also on the board of uh, Thai. Uh, then uh, Ms. Nirmala Raghavan, the CEO and, uh, CEO and Director of Pedagogy at uh, uh, NRITT, uh, the Institute for T Teacher Training. She, she would be sort of delving into something that was shared in the first session, the pedagogy uh, challenges. And then, of course, uh, Professor uh, Kannan, uh, you know, uh, who needs no introduction, a, a phenomenal teacher, a passionate skilling advocate, and a uh, uh, and a great dosa party host, as some of us uh, found out yesterday. Uh, so maybe we start with Mr. Andle, uh, you know, because you've been on both sides of the equation, sir. You've 
uh, you know you've been an entrepreneur you're uh, you're, a, you're you've been a promoter of uh, uh, of a big software company but you've also mentored several it startups you're a stakeholder in an education institution uh, you know so how do you see the scaling challenge in the indian context how can industry and academia really make a make a difference thank you uh, i'm very happy to be here amongst all of you so uh, I'll, I'll start with the, my experience at Soil, School of Inspired Leadership, and why did we start it? What was the background of it? So I was a part of a consulting organization called Grow Talent, which was started in uh, early 2000. And for about 10 years, we were doing all kind of trans trans transformational HR leadership work across the country, including companies like Tata Motors and we, we had become very good in turning around, helping companies turn around. Now, all this while, as we were talking to these companies, they all talked about leadership vacuum. And when we started asking them questions as to what kind of a leadership are you looking for at recruitment level and things of that kind, we got very different answers. So we called about 30, 35 of these uh, RR customers of that time, uh, including uh, Bharat Petroleum, Tata Steel, Infosys, SAF, Schneider, Kohler, and sat down with them for an exercise. And what it turned out is that they can get good managers from all the institutions. but what they found that these managers took a lot of time in developing skills which are required for senior leadership roles. So entry point, they're fabulous, fantastic. But as they grow up, they start having problems. So what did we identify? We identified that they are looking for five key elements in their uh, future leadership uh, pro uh, profile. And these couple of elements we listed them as mindfulness, being present, being aware, ethics, compassion, so that they are able to work with the with people in teams, sustainability. Now, while we talk about these subjects as courses in many of the management institutions, but how, how do we help them actually practice? And this is what this is what resulted in the formation of or setting up of, of soil. So when we had set up soil, it was recognized as the most innovative uh, uh, curriculum in the by the industry by CII, uh, most innovative uh, one. And we talked about beyond management education. How do we build awareness and consciousness? about these five elements. Just to give you an example, how do we, how do we teach ethics? Can, can we teach ethics by a classroom session? I mean, it's something that we all experience. We have ethical dilemmas. And that's when we start exploring. So we use theater for exploring ethics. We used social innovation program, spending a day every week with the NGO of your choice to understand, to see what the other world is all about. This year, uh, I'm a part of another group at Bodh Gaya. They conducted, a uh, for 50 students, a one month internship in the villages of Bodh Gaya. And, you know, you'll be surprised that majority of the students had never been to a village, had never seen a village. So it was we had to then change the whole uh, approach that we had taken. And we said just, instead of giving just an exposure, it's more important to give them an exposure or a kind of a orientation towards these issues. So we created a program on water consciousness, Jal Chetna, for them. Because before they go to the village, they ought to know what water consciousness means. Otherwise, they look, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they are hardly able to understand the water issues in agriculture, water issues in, uh, in a village. We are very, very accustomed to opening the tap and getting water and that's it. 
That, that's what I get water from. But what does a villager have to do to get water? It's 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 altogether a diff different exercise. So how do we develop, and how do I help this villager develop higher consciousness towards water? Now I, I'll just stop here because these are these are some of the elements, soft elements you may call it. These need to be inculcated in our uh, curriculum at appropriate time. As Mr. Ramesh was sharing, we teach a nautical engineering thing. But what is required in industry, what is required in life is something different. Thank you. So we can go to uh, Mr. Ramesh. I mean, uh, you know, just taking off from what Mr. Andre had said, to what extent do some of these uh, sort of the so-called softer skill sets uh, help uh, on the shop floor, uh, you know, in the longer run? That is one question. Also, since a lot of teachers are sitting here, is there a message in terms of, you know, what is it, what, what are those particular skill sets that you perhaps look out for when you select 20 out of 50 candidates? What are the things that you don't want? What are the things that you, you know, do not pick a candidate for? Hi, everyone, once more. Before I uh, start my uh, talk, uh, one of the things I wanted to take a second question first. Uh, what the industry is looking for in a student is basically is uh, first is ethics, uh, ethics and honesty. This is what uh, we are expecting. Uh, this is uh, non-negotiable. Uh, character, ethics, honesty, this is one thing we are expecting out of the student. And other than that, in an industrial environment, is uh, more than a technical skill. He's supposed to exhibit teamwork because uh, every station of uh, work in an industry involves teamwork. So without teamwork, you can't achieve anything. So teamwork is very important. Of course, technical skills are important. But there again, uh, there, is a, there is a place where the technical skills uh, are to be used in a... Uh, in a uh, very high environment, like say R&D type of environment, where technical skills are used uh, maybe day in, day out. But once R&D type of department re releases a drawing, it uh, issues a drawing with a lot of thought behind it. Incidentally, uh, R&D engineers in Bajaj are one of the highest paid engineers uh, in Bajaj also. They are really selected and a lot of IIT engineers are working, sir, I should say there, in R&D. When they are uh, issuing a drawing, mean they are doing a lot of due diligence and sending it. When it comes to the shop floor to work, now he is not supposed to look at uh, you know again design. There is a department who has worked on that and he has released it. Now this department is supposed to work on improvements. So his mind and uh, his mindset should be towards improvement. So when we select a candidate for uh, uh, shop operations or operation side, we look uh, a characteristic such as uh, improving improving the current system, uh, you know, improving the throughput, improving the efficiency, improving the overall line efficiency. So these are the characteristics we are looking at and also working uh, with uh, various, uh, you know, stakeholders, both internal as well as external. So these are the characteristics we are looking for as far as uh, uh, these people are concerned. As far as marketing, once you go to marketing, then today being a global environment, we are looking at uh, global orientation for the student uh, whom are we are taking you should not only be outgoing but also you should be you should think global for example bajaj gone are the days uh, of uh, chetak being sold only in india now uh, bajaj is exporting to 100 countries uh, we are one of the top exporters in the country our 65 percent of our production is exported so we are looking for that type of candidate uh, for an export type of uh, marketing type of environment so there are different, uh, a, you know, different horses for different bosses. So that is the type of thing. There's no one single thing uh, we are looking at uh, when we are uh, recruiting. Uh, also, one small thing also I want to add uh, to my presentation is that, uh, you know, in uh, Bajaj type of companies, which are uh, little, uh, you know, very old companies, 45-year-old, 50-year-old, even Tata Motors, even Mahindra for that matter, they are pretty, you can call them as legacy companies. In these companies, there are a lot of workers uh, which will be, uh, you can very commonly find people working for 30 years, 25 years, 40 years and all. 
uh, unlike uh, IT industry, where uh, five years means you are considered a veteran. I'm sure Balaji will uh, subscribe to it. But uh, in our case, uh, you'll very commonly find 30, 35 year old uh, people working, uh, experienced people. Now, the flip side of it is, in the next two, three years, about 60 to 65 percent of our workers are going to retire. So there's going to create a huge vacuum, not only in our company, also in companies like uh, Tata's and uh, Mahindra's and all. So one hand, the workers are retiring. On the other hand, technology has advanced. Gone are the days of lathes and uh, drops and uh, those type of machines. You won't find a single uh, equipment like that in any of my, forget me, even my second tire vendor, you won't find such uh, uh, you know, machines. So you need to have new age technologies, 21st century technologies you need. For example, uh, my vendor, my first tire vendor, is having something like 1,200 robots. Uh, my second tire vendor is having about 400 robots. Uh, and uh, AI, and they are, uh, they are in multi locations also across the world. Wherever we are going, we are also taking our vendors. So that's the uh, nature of uh, uh, you know, the companies and the nature of job requirement. So this creates, uh, uh, you know, uh, engineers with 21st century skills. I was glad to see a uh, lot of you were talking about, uh, you know, soft skills and uh, AI. And uh, uh, I'm sure India is in good hands, uh, uh, thanks to professor and uh, spoken tutorial. I'm sure uh, there'll be a lot of a bunch of engineers who will be coming with uh, curated skills. Uh, this will only uh, augur well for the Indian industry in future. And also before I move to the others, you know, this initiative by the government on uh, on internships, you did briefly sort of mention that there needs to be some more fine tuning. Do how does that dovetail in with, say, the kind of work that teachers here uh, are, are doing? If internship in corporate companies were to become sort of mandatory, at least for the top 500 companies, is there something that the education system perhaps needs to gear up for or teachers like them need to gear up for? My personal uh, assessment is that uh, um, teachers need to be exposed to industry too. Uh, it should not be just academics. You need to encourage students to take uh, industry relevant projects. Uh, industry is willing to give projects also. The uh, only gap is that uh, uh, students are not exposed to industry ready equipments. So, Slowly, we should build up this capability by giving them internships, by giving them exposure to uh, industry in and around uh, the school, college, wherever. We should follow the uh, system of uh, Germany. In Germany, any engineer, uh, anybody, not just not necessarily engineer, anybody graduating there uh, is skilled. They have to go through a skill course. 100% everybody is skilled. So we need to go to that level if we want to compete globally. So that's one thing. And second thing is, uh, these days, a lot of industries like Bajaj, uh, TBS, uh, Tata Motors, Mahindra, they're all giving a lot of uh, on-job training also for uh, students. Uh, there are a lot of programs like uh, Will Program and other programs uh, initiated by the government where uh, ITA students are taken as interns and uh, given a one-year, two-year internship uh, in uh, companies where they can get good exposure also. also if not anything, uh, you should bring your students, at least from school level onwards, you can bring the students to the industry. Uh, to engineering students can visit the industry when they are working. They can get an exposure to how an industry works. Let me assure you, uh, their eyes will open and a lot of entrepreneurs could probably come out of that home, not just employees. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Narsima, if uh, I can come to you, uh, you know, you've you sort of worked with campus entrepreneurs, uh, you know. My question is, what can be done to sort of, you know, uh, scale up India's startup ecosystem, make it more uh, amenable to, to genuine innovation, and that, you know, typically Indian startups that start something tend to cash out or sell out before becoming big. We don't really have a genuinely big you know, startup idea that's grown to scale, and by scale, I mean, you know, global scale or scale that a Chinese company has probably reached. What needs to be changed to foster that kind of stuff? I think 
I will not even get there in terms of exits, right? How soon they should exit? How large the companies that they build? We have a lot more fundamental problem. Are they creating companies which are of deep innovation, right? So uh, it really pains. Sorry if I'm hurting anyone's sentiments here. It really pains me when I look at an IIT graduate, right? Probably top of the tire IIT graduate building a startup around food delivery, right? I'm not demeaning, but that shows where our heart is, right? So I think the fundamental challenge is we don't take pride and confidence in innovating something, right? That's where the fundamental, irrespective of what education that you have gone through, we have failed to instill confidence and motivation to do some deep work in India. That's where my problem starts with a lot of stuff. And that's where uh, probably the points that uh, Ramesh was talking about, faculties being exposed in this one, right? That's problem starts with the faculties. Faculty is not having confidence in believing that they can help their students build something good or their students can build something good, right? So this is where my challenge is. In fact, my I always say this, sir, right? It's not that academicians need to follow industry. Probably even industry should start following academics, right? So, I mean, for all the great things that we talk about to answer your questions, it's true that a lot of our students are not employable, but a lot of our industries are also not able to leverage the kind of talent that we have in this country. So it's a two-way track, right? So before that, this is what I would suggest, right? I think. I was very, very heartening to see in a discussion around skill set, uh, both the speakers spoke about value system, right? If there is something which bothers me as an investor, as a VC today, right? Not just as a corporate, it's a value system students have. It's their uh, integrity. It's their health, right? Very, very bad health of our youngsters. These are the, in fact, I don't call them soft skills. I will call them soul skills, right? What's missing is the soul skills. Students don't have value system because we have taught them just go and compete. Don't do it. I mean, don't worry about attending a family function, but what's important is scoring 1% more, right? So the biggest challenge that we have is those value systems. That's what hampers, that affects us as investors, and I'm sure that affects us the corporates, right? So their ability or motivation to just go and work is not there. That's the biggest gap that we have. As far as innovation is concerned, I think it's very, very simple, right? I feel this can be solved very easily in this country. Just allow youngsters to do projects, right? Focus on them doing projects, help them figure out something which they are really passionate about. Don't worry about what market size that they are going after, how big the company that they are building, but make sure that they pick up a challenge which has the deep innovation or deep thinking. Ask them to build it when they are in the curriculum, I'm sure they'll be useful to Ramesh, that will be, they'll be useful to me and they'll be useful to many of us, right? Once students figure out they have some passion in that, then rest a lot of skills will come up, right? Because by definition, if you are passionate about, about something, you will develop empathy and you will do a lot more good things, right? There is, it's not without a reason that all entrepreneurs are the great contributors to, uh, I mean, society, right? So my suggestion is, just have them ability to think deep, figure out a product, figure out a problem, and then rest of them learn. And that's where things like spoken tutorials, etc., will really help because what you are instilling them is ability to go and learn whatever you want, right? Irrespective of the background from which you are, right? So uh, I would stop at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, if I can turn to you, ma'am, uh, uh, you've been listening to to the presentations and the talks earlier, um, uh, you know, uh, the the need for pedagogy to sort of foster curiosity and critical thinking is something that, that's been talked about. But just to take off from what at least all three of them have said, you know, some of the more important things are perhaps things like value systems, uh, which are difficult to teach perhaps because kids carry through what they've learned from their parents or neighbors or friends and you know uh, it's difficult to instill it in a three a three or four two-year management course or a three-year graduation course so that is one and uh, you know in the way uh, uh, you know tutorials like the spoken tutorial you know all of the teachers who are using it a question that comes to my mind is how do you execute it in a manner that it fosters teamwork is that is that something that is possible to maybe you know 
Jan instilled into the world? Yeah, this is a question that really needs thinking because all the time, even if it is spoken tutorials, we are talking about a, a set curriculum, a fixed you know, agenda for you know, whatever exam or the course. And what happens is, as the panelists have said, ethics, empathy kind of things don't play a role or have no space in the curriculum or in the agenda. Uh, whatever we teach as teachers, as professors, we have an agenda, a curriculum to complete, uh, to show that we have scored so much. Uh, but do we, have we really thought of the empathy and the, that has gone away because of our societal changes also. We are not there to sit and complain or look back and say, okay, this is not working. But how do we do it? So every teacher, when she enters the class, a professor, when she enters the class, she must be able to think or fix her mind on some kind of ethic that she can bring into the lesson so that it goes as part of the lesson. Because schools, organizations, boards are not going to allow us to have a separate time for these things, for value systems. So, of course, managements do talk about it, schools do talk about it, teachers also talk about it, but, you know, unfortunately, uh, it, it is only there because I've been a professor and a teacher, so I know it has never, ever happened. We only take time off from the set, fixed curriculum to say, look, this is what it is, when somebody is fighting, when somebody is not behaving properly. So there was a, a party in the, within the classroom for something that we celebrated. This was a sixth standard class. And one child wanted to have all the Miranda. And he could rest only after he had the full bottle, which denied five or six others of, you know. So how do I bring it in the lesson is a big question. And we know today we are deplete of value systems. It is not there at all. One, because of the rat race that we are running through to earn and to compete with my partner and my neighbor. And two, because that has very sadly gone away from our system. And I represent Wheels Global Foundation. So we, as a mission and a vision, uh, we are here to uplift the rural, you know, uh, kids. I talk about the, about, of the education segment. So we are here to uplift the rural children to the, you know, uh, to bring them into the ecosystem of IIT. So this is where we want to really uh, be, to take spoken tutorials to, uh, because that is going to be a huge challenge convincing, you know, uh, localites there in the rural area to say, see, look, this will work really well. And this is what we really look for today. And so that is going to be a huge challenge, but I'm sure we will work at it because there's nobody else who's doing that, right? And we don't see a structured system. Of course, we do look at a structured system because we won't have gaps there. We would be able to, you know, accreditation we have all been talking about. So how do we measure what we teach? So we need to have a structure, but we should also have some kind of system where we are leveraging, you know, creativity. Like, you know, when I came into IIT Mumbai, I was reminded of Nandan Nilakeni. And I remember his words, the DPI, digital public infrastructure, has now changed to digital public intelligence. And that AI is not the future, it's today here with us, right? We have it in our mobile, your Aadhaar card, your uh, you know, KYC. I mean, he gives a list of things that we are, where we use AI. And therefore, it is very, very important for us as teachers to see that we know it first, and then we take to the class whatever we can understand. See, there is no fixed curriculum for what we know, right? Minor, what I know, what I experience is different from my partner. So whatever we can understand, whatever we can take to class, feel something. So what is, what is the criteria for that? Internet, which gives you the AI, that's important. Something that makes you feel good, makes the other person also feel good. And then about the life values itself. So this is what he says. And I'm sure most of you have heard about Dr. Sugata Mitra. I'm a great fan of whatever he you know says. So he talks about three C's for the future of work. Can anybody guess? He talks about three C's for the future of work. That's going to be the future, at least for the next 10 years is what he vouches. Okay, for those of you who don't know Sugata Mitra, he is a TED uh, Prize winner. Uh, mil he won a billion dollar for his experiment on uh, using the internet to learn by oneself. 
So he call, he floats a program called Soul, and I have advocated this in pl plenty of schools in Tamil Nadu. Soul is self-organized learning environment. So he says, give the children a big question. Let not the teacher intervene, even if they don't know English. Four or five students at one computer with one computer, give them a time where they can browse and research. And then after say two or three months, he says, children can learn by themselves, say to the PhD level. This is an experiment he's done in plenty of places in India, abroad, and he says, this will happen. Children can and must learn by themselves. So the three C's for the future of work. Can anybody guess? What's the computer concept? Uh, uh, no, a better word. So these words end with ing. Coding. Super. Who's that? Yeah, please stand up. Give him, give her a clap. Yeah. What are the other two? Coding. Two more. Creating. Creating? No. Communicating. Communicating. Super. Who said that? Yeah, you. Give him a clap. What's your name? Okay. Yeah. One more. So coding, computing, and one more. The third one. Um, no, no, no. Coding, and then you said? Communicating. Communicating. Then one more. Collaborating. Collaborating? No, no. Okay, I will say comprehending. So whether you are a mechanical engineer or a literature uh, major student, or say you've done ancient history, if you can say, I want to be an engineer, you have the best of the resources on the net to go learn and then say, look, I can do these, these, these. Give me a job for that. Or then maybe probably you can start it yourself. See, these compartmentalized education, I think, will also go in the, you know, uh, I mean, the way forward. Because already homeschooling is becoming a, uh, not a fashion, but a set thing in uh, plenty of uh, places where parents are well informed. So they expose their children to the best of the knowledge that is accessible and available on the net. And we know how much is available. So uh, I end with this, that the future of work, uh, this is Sugata Mitra's word, not my word, that it is coding, comprehending, and communicating. The way I code, the way I know how to program, that's very, very important. Comprehending is what I can understand with whatever I read. Communicating is what I can share with others whatever I know. These three will be three very, very important skills for the future of work. And I also believe that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Kandan, sir, uh, coming to you uh, and from whatever you've heard here and obviously whatever happened in the first session, with, the, with about a decade and a half of experience of these two projects uh, with you and now which is a widening sort of a pool, how do you see the the next leap forward? Can India use this uh, sort of a medium to bridge the skills gap? You're absolutely right. The brick and mortar uh, model might not work. But how do you scale this up to the next level? How do you dovetail AI in? What can teachers do to 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 for the next level of uh, you know scaling up? Thanks, Sasi. Uh, very good question. Very important question, uh, especially for India, because some time ago I heard that, I mean, I heard that Finland has the best schooling system, for example. And I went there and uh, stayed with somebody who, in fact, he studied in the SRM, and then he's a, a big time uh, person in uh, Finland. And he was really disappointed with the uh, Finland uh, schooling system. So they are not teaching anything. The students are, children are left to do whatever they want, things like that. I think our uh, problem is uh, one of uh, not being able to make things available for large sections of the society. We seem to take pride in selecting only a few and offering them the best, letting everybody else rot, OK? Some people would call it Brahminical system, OK? I think 
what is important is to um, we we don't need too many Nobel laureates in that sense. We do. I mean, people who are anyway we haven't had too many Nobel laureates anyway from India. So what we need is to get a lot of people be given minimal kind of education. For example, I was talking about uh, people who can't code in the morning. Okay, <coughs> people are not getting, people have been getting only 20,000 rupees starting salary in IT companies for 20 years as uh, starting. At the same time, if you want to develop a nice web page or something, then they say Drupal, $25 hour minimum. That too concessional because you are an academic institute. Mm -hmm. That means people command a lot more. The reason is there are only a few people who are doing exceedingly well and there are lots of people who are not doing, who don't know anything at all. So we really need to ramp up our uh, ability to bring everybody to some minimal standard. Like for example, in the US people will say McDonald's. You go to McDonald's, you will have a restroom, you will have this, you will have that. May not be greatest quality. Similarly, if you go to a UDP restaurant, you will get, uh, you know, good set of, uh, you know, Italy sambar, vada sambar within, you know, five minutes. And minimal quality guarantee. Not very expensive, but good quality. So I think it is important to make such a thing available in the education sector for uh, in a larger scale. The fact that we are talking about tier 3, tier 4, why should they be tier 3, tier 4? In fact, I was asked to be a member of one um, uh, committee uh, formed in, the, uh, in Delhi with NASCOM uh, vice president and so on and so forth. They asked me to be a member. And one of the first questions I asked was, we are talking about artificial intelligence, what about natural intelligence? We don't seem to be talking about that, okay? And at that time, they were talking about one million jobs. And uh, I was uh, attending um, an academic council meeting in PSG Tech, Coimbatore. And the person who was sitting next to me was AI expert. He said, oh, uh, you don't know that AI is dead? I said, what? Only one year ago, they said one million jobs? He said, no, no, generative AI is the, now the thing, not just the normal AI. So today it is generative AI, tomorrow it could be some other uh, degenerative AI, you never know. What I am saying is, it is important to understand these technologies will come. We have to be on top of it. We have to learn, we have to put them, you know, uh, when banks were automated, there was a lot of uh, uproar, protests saying technology is coming, they are going to take away our jobs. They didn't take away the jobs. The jobs, the work has only increased. I think, as Sai Shudha will say, we should use AI as a, as a help. I mean, it is not AI, is it AI versus us? Not that. It should be AI with us. We should take, make use of it, just like any other tool, as it is available at that appropriate uh, 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 development level of technology. And... Um, um, yeah, that's my comment about AI also. Yeah. Uh, just a, you know, uh, something that is sort of linked to this. Um, I think a few months after uh, OpenAI uh, un uh, unveiled uh, ChatGPT, GPT-3, uh, Salman Khan uh, uh, of Khan Academy. So he, uh, he, he did say that he saw an opportunity in AI being used to personalize the, the, the delivery of the uh, educational module, uh, you know, uh, tuned to the needs of an individual student at a, you know, at perhaps a, a future point in time. Do, do you see something like that? Yeah, it's already happening. Actually, yesterday evening, my grandson asked me, uh, so what are you going to speak? I said that's a, a teacher training, you know, teachers are going to be there, some 70 teachers. 
and I'm going to be there in the panel discussion. I said, okay, you tell me what can I speak. He's in the sixth standard. Today morning he came up to say, I think you should say that there are uh, plenty of students and good teachers are not there. Maybe AI can help us. That's what he said. You know, as I was leaving, he said, remember to say that. So now, you know, he's in the sixth standard and uh, the time screen time is limited. Uh, and still they have enough time to find out what they want. And I don't think we as teachers or uh, you know administrators will have the control. Stella Maris College in Chennai, I remember uh, 10 years before, we would confiscate all the mobiles and give it to them only when they go back home. I think uh, when COVID came, mobile became the learning device. Yeah, so it is not going to go, it's come to stay with us. We must see how we can make it a teaching tool rather than a cheating tool. Yeah. So, so there comes the ethics and the morality and you know, self-discipline, all that stuff. Anil, I just want to add a sure. point yeah. here. Right. Yeah. See, I mean, enough is said about the curriculum that we have is not industry ready, etc. Right. So, I mean, a lot of us will come and say that, I mean, I studied so much of calculus, what's the use of it in the industry? But my point to them always is that if you had read calculus well, and if you had decided to make use of it in your career, probably you would have made use of it, right? So I want to answer that. <laughs> okay, quadratic equation, I read. But after that, I have never, ever. No, that's... If no, you, I mean, <laughs> so I learned it because my parents compelled me, put me in a school where they taught it. I had a board which tested me in that. Today's child will ask, why do I have to learn? I don't need it. No, probably that's a, that's the point that I'm trying to say, right? It's not that quadratic equations don't have relevance in the industry today. There are some subjects, there are some areas in which even quadratic equation is relevant today. So one of the points that I was trying to do is, I mean, this is my challenge. Take any textbook, open randomly any page, any page, any textbook, right? I can tell you list of research that's happening around the subject in that book. I can give you a list of startups that are created around that subject. And I can tell you what are the jobs available around reading that subject. Any textbook, anything, any subject, this one I'll tell you. It's just that we have failed to induce them the art of loving that subject. Right? So, I mean, Maybe you teachers themselves are teach already. this one, right? So, I mean, I wanted to get to this AI, right? One of the best way, I mean, this is what I suggest in all my faculty development program whenever I called up. Before you go to the classroom, just do a search saying that what are the research opportunities around available around this particular topic that I'm teaching? What are the startups that are available around this subject that I'm teaching? And what are the jobs that are around, right? I mean, you'll be surprised to look at the kind of answers that uh, your AI engine will come back to you with. And that should probably motivate a lot more of you and your students to take that class much better. So it's it's just that you need to be passionate and you need to have the confidence and you need to instill that confidence that whatever you are teaching today is equally important, right? And not just what they study in last three months of placement preparation. I just want to add uh, two interesting things to your uh, talk and also to Madam's uh, thought on uh, use of quadratic equations. Uh, sorry, Madam. <laughs> A little bit I'll be contradicting you. Uh, two examples I want to tell you. Uh, one example was when I was working in Sundaram Clayton uh, before Bajaj, when I was in R&D, uh, we were working, uh, that is a pneumatic uh, valve company. Uh, uh, whichever uh, truck you see, uh, whatever sounds you hear, it is because of Sundaram Clayton's valves only are actuators. So I was working in, and we were one of, uh, one of, I was one of eight R&D engineers working in uh, that uh, place. Uh, uh, we had a, normally on Saturdays in Sundaram Clayton, we used to have uh, lectures from various professors. That was a lecture day eight, uh, for uh, engineers to upgrade their skills on various aspects. Uh, one of the lectures, uh, once uh, Professor Narendra Sheth came from Ford Motors, USA. They, he came to give a talk on uh, ANOVA, analysis of variants. Uh, may he gave a talk, sir. And uh, it was such so interesting. Uh, we wanted to delve more into it. So he gave a talk and he gave us projects and he told us how it can be used for uh, experimentation, how you can predict uh, the performance of various uh, valves through mathematical uh, equations, how you can do it. So uh, 
we were very enthusiastic and we uh, we also designed a valve and uh, into a equation you know various flow parameters various venturis we worked out and we said that uh, this this is uh, what it is so whatever we decided of course he has a lot of he was a head of statistics in ford motors he was working there for many years so when we were telling uh, this is how our valve performance will be if i vary this parameter this will vary if i vary this this will vary so like that we were predicting but uh, compared to us he went almost uh, uh, i can say 50 times more he could predict more about the valve uh, in that half an hour session looking at our equation he was predicting more about the valve what i mean to say is uh, the uh, this is what i was talking about where you want to use it also you need to have an application knowledge on uh, how to use it where to use it engineering is not bad uh, wherever you use it uh, you need to uh, have teachers to teach us how to apply also where to apply what to apply if you want to learn only by rote only to pass that's one thing but how to use life skills is also important how you use that's in the morning during my talk i was uh, mentioning about learning for the sake of learning is something um, i was talking about i didn't complete the story um, uh, i found out why i was not doing well in the first semester i applied this initially i seemed to stumble but later on i came up with uh, flying colors that's the reason why i told my students uh, which didn't work because our students are not mature our problem is not one of uh, learning quadratic uh, trigonometry but is but it is one of solving some trigonometry problem in thousand different ways so that you get admission to iit that is a problem that is a problem our problem is um we are not using learning we are we are not uh, we are not putting in effort to learn something new but we are putting lot of effort to find out what you know entrance exams okay so that is the reason why i said that our uh, of course i am making this statement after doing a lot of uh, this for our uh, you know when we admit people to our internships fellowships we don't want to find out what all you have done we want to find out whether you can solve my problem i have a problem i'm going to produce a simple version of it can you solve it i will take you so in other words if i would rather have somebody who wants to become a mechanical engineer to demonstrate that he or she uh, is actually interested in mechanical engineering and done some work it could even be just two years of mechanical in fact that's why i've been saying admit to iit only for third and fourth year first two years let them go to colleges ordinary colleges let them study make all the nptel courses available teach them let them study well if they want to be a civil engineer they should study first two years of civil engineering well you test them if they are doing well you select them even if they don't get selected they will be good civil engineers right right now what do we do we ask them on the 12th portion thousand ways of solving some useless thing it will never come if you look at the correlation between the rank that one scores in jee versus the you know their success in life nothing there may not be much right yeah uh, mr andle you wanted to say something and then we'll probably wrap it up in uh, a couple of questions we can try and slip in because we got sure so yeah. this this will sound more like a commercial uh, break but i want to share about share few of our experiences with you uh one experience is from soil and second experience is from uh, our school of design thinking in chennai where we are doing a lot of uh, similar works so in soil when we sat down and started designing curriculum we said that our evaluation is not going to be on how many marks a student has got okay 
So what we defined was a competence capa capability matrix. What does this mean? Is we identified there are five or six elements on which a student must be graded. And in those elements, we have behavioral trends from one to five. A role model is, or an inspired leader, is a student who is not only academically good, but also helps the entire class to raise its standard. Now what it means is he's not competitive. He's not collaborative. He understands who's weak, helps him or her grow up and challenge the ones who are bright. Now this capacity competence matrix resulted in our grades as this person is an inspired leader and the entry level is this person is just a basic learner. Fine. Now, while we could do it because of curriculum, the entire thing was in our control. I know all of you are covered by AICT and universities and things of that kind. But you may want to implement something of this kind in your curriculum, in your course, in your college. Recognizing students for the kind of behavior that they exhibit. Second thing I would like to share from share with you are two things we are, we are doing in Chennai. We run a trust called Ullas Trust. Now in Ullas Trust, we select students from municipal schools, every year about 2,000, 2,500 students. We give them one year of exposure in our industry, in our office. And in that exposure, we don't talk about maths and science and physics and things of that kind. We talk about the power of dreaming. We talk about planning for your dreams. We talk about how do you achieve your dreams. So we run a full program called Diary of Dreams. And this program, we're very happy to share with you, has actually been taken by many social service organizations and taken across states. So we encourage all our uh, people who are working with us to take this program, do it in their school, wherever, which college, school, wherever they studied. Second thing we figured out that at the engineering colleges, this is what we have done with AICT, we need to have an initial orientation course of one or two credits on design thinking and problem solving. So how do we help students look at what the life is going to Show, show to us the problems that will show us. I mean, solve your day-to-day -day life problems. What does teamwork mean? What causes friction in a team? How do you help overcome friction? What are the factors which help you accelerate as a team? All these things are taught. And what we realized is, when we started doing this program in these in the colleges in Tamil Nadu, the, we noticed, we, we first invited the faculty for an orientation program. And what we realize is that a faculty who's teaching chemistry has little interaction with another faculty member who's teaching maths or uh, mechanical engineering or civil engineering. So he or she, while she's teaching chemistry, cannot correlate with how chemistry is going to be used in civil engineering. And the moment we started doing this kind of a program, suddenly what we noticed that these departmental silos, they started melting away. And this one, two, two credit program we can share with you and probably I'll encourage Professor Kanan also to take it and see how it can be made as a part of spoken tutorial. But this became a foundation course. And AICT has also been there, the teams have been there, they have liked it and they have started uh, spreading it, sharing it with other, co with other, other colleges. So I'll just stop here. These couple of experiments I thought I'll share with you. A lot of uh, food for thought. Uh, uh, if anyone from the panel wants to say something more to wrap up, we've got 10 more minutes. And if there are any more questions from the audience, you can probably get... Uh, get. Yeah, ma'am. So I just want to say, whatever we speak about curriculum or standards or scores, the joy of learning and teaching is what we need to inculcate. And I think the rest of the things will follow automatically. The joy of teaching and the joy of learning. I would also like to add about uh, internship. When we were starting our company, 
in 85, we realized bits, we, we got many engineering, I mean, engineering colleges or MCA was at its early stages at, in 85. Delhi University had an MCA program, JNU had an MCA program, but not many engineering colleges were there at that time. BITS had a wonderful program called Practice School. So every student of BITS Pilani would go to a company and will work there for full six months, full one semester. And that turned out to be a fantastic program for us because we could get the best engineers from BITS. They would be there with three, four, four six months with us. And uh, they, they'll help us do all our development work. They, they'll work almost like a full-time employee with us. Now, this as compared to the typical internship of a month, 30 days in an industry, where it's a burden to the industry as well as a challenge for the student. Now, if you could, I don't know how will, how will it happen, but if you could have six months of internship, definitely the industry would, well, my feeling is, would welcome that and would sort of engage, involve more with students. With one month of internship, it's nowhere, it's neither here nor, nor there. Uh, any questions from there, the... There is a question. I have something uh, very, uh, dif slightly different view to talk about at this point. As you, actually, we talked about the teaching and methods of teaching and we think about, you know, like, you know, I also studied Schrodinger equation. If I say today that when did I, what did I mean by Schrodinger equation at that time, it's difficult. But when I look at it in a past, when I studied at uh, IIT Delhi, when I studied engineering drawing, I could visualize objects which don't exist in front of me. It taught me a skill to be able to visualize, imagine, and Today, for me to visualize some customer's requirements, it helps. That engineering drawing helps today. I studied mathematics, algebra, in-depth algebra, calculus, everything. Today, lots of problems when we are actually sitting and visualizing them. These imaginations, how to visualize and pair some problem with an, a solution comes from there, comes from algebra, comes from what do you call yukpat samikaran, or solving complex equations, okay? So what I'm saying is, I think one of the issues that we have at, our, uh, at this point of time is to get the students to study for the sake of learning. Unfortunately for our environment, what has happened just because our parents are busy talking about how his son has got better job or better salary or a better uh, uh, workplace as compared to his neighbor's son. <laughs> Sorry, isn't it correct? Uh, everybody can laugh about it, but isn't it correct? Everybody talks about my son got this job at this salary. And the newspapers talk about what was the highest salary in this institute. They don't talk about what was the capability of that person and that person 10 years hence, what did he achieve for the society? Nobody talks about it. Unfortunately, this is how our system has dragged it back into the learning systems going in the wrong direction. I, can, I would like also like to make one more observation. Yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, because we are running a management institute, we keep talking to faculty all over the, you know, teachers, academicians all over the world. And what we have started hearing now is that the role of teacher is shifting phenomenally. Fine. Anything that you want to ask, the student can go and get it from chat GPT or gen generative AI and give you a beautiful a five page essay. Fine, and if, if you were to just evaluate the essay, each and every student will get 99% marks because it's so beautifully crafted, so very well written. 
So teachers say we have to start looking at a different way of evaluating our students. So we say we have started asking students, is fine, you have submitted this assignment, beautiful, five page of very well written English and covered almost all aspect of what we are asking you. Tell us what did you ask AI to, what questions did you pose or what pointers did you give to AI? And we are going to evaluate on those pointers. So the teacher's role has now become not to teach the subject, but actually to talk about the pointers, they can get the best answer out of uh, generative AI. Thank you. I'll just tell one small, uh, um, you know, small example of how teaching was done. For some time, uh, I was uh, I was actually heading the China initiative in Bajaj. So I used to live in China for six years. But my wife was also with me in China. She studied Chinese also for some time. My son studied 9th and 10th in China, so in an international school. In this school, one of the interesting things, English subject, was taught in a different way, which uh, I was not used to, but then they taught it in a different way. What they used to do was that lesson, uh, all the students are supposed to learn at home and come to the class. So they used to insist, the teacher used to insist, he was from uh, UK actually, the teacher, so he used to insist that uh, the student learn at home and come. And once they come there, there used to be a debate. In the sense, uh, hero of the story is there, some characters are there. Now supposing uh, I'm the hero of the story, say, in that lesson. So I'm supposed to, the teacher will say, now you have to tell negative things about the hero. I'm supposed to talk negative about the hero. And the rest of the people are supposed to debate. How he is not, uh, how he is a real hero, not a negative person. Okay. So for me to talk negative, I have to thoroughly study the lesson and find out what are those negative characteristics. Okay. So I have to tell that. And other people also to debate that. They should know the positive aspect of that. So with the reason, by debating, the, they learn thoroughly the lesson. So this is one way of teaching uh, they used to do. This is a flipped method. Yeah. This is known as the flipped method. <laughs> Uh, sir, can I ask something? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Himakshi Goswami. I am an assistant professor in JSPM RSCOE College Engineering, Rajasishahu College of Engineering. Uh, we have grassroots level experience with our students, hands on always. So uh, basically, if one thing, you know, the moment the session starts, whenever you interact for the first time with our students, if you ask you, why did you choose, you know, when you start, we, we, we try to assimilate with them. We ask, why did you choose this branch? Or why did you opt for CS? Why did you opt for mechanical or something? The first thing, we did not get through IIT. We did not get through NIT. We did not get through COEP. So we came here. So the first experience, the dream they have is a, you know, on a negative side. So I, and another thing who had, you know, for the last five, six years we have experienced is that, you know, that I was in the industry earlier. I have just come down to the teaching few, two years back. One thing I have experienced, although mechanical is something was considered one of the fantastic brands, everybody wanted to get into mechanical, electrical, some those branches. Now everybody wants to go to CS. And inside their mind, they are made for mechanical. They have the deal inside them to build something on their own. But they want to be in computer science. So how to address both the things? I really want to know from your side. I'll answer the mechanical and computer science part. I think the first part, uh, somebody else can answer. Because I've experienced this. So because I have, uh, in the process of our implementation of Vesta, I have visited uh, more than uh, 100 odd uh, universities and colleges in India to select the universities, which are the best universities I would have visited. And uh, we, when I visit the university, I go and see each and every department. Let me tell you, the mechanical engineering department typically is in a tin shed with some old lathes and uh, people filing uh, 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 sheet metal. This is mechanical engineering. You come out just across, there's a five-star, seven-star building <laughs> with a digital uh, thing and uh, professors are uh, going here and there and uh, uh, that's computer science. <laughs> so first is, and let me tell you, um, no industry has got filing. No industry has got a lathe today. So the image what you are projecting of a mechanical engineer, engineering itself is not correct. 
first uh, uh, student you see any anywhere uh, about mechanical engineering what they'll show they'll show only a lathe running let me tell you in my uh, plant chakan plant where uh, triumph motorcycles are made uh, ktm motorcycles are made uh, in the line there is no person nobody even gives material uh, autonomous mobile robot delivers the material people are only monitoring so this is uh, today's industry but does the student is the student aware about it no so that's why we brought this course to tell them what is mechanical engineering today so what type of work you can do and another uh, example of why people choose computer science is sundar pichai everybody wants to be a sundar pichai but there's only one sundar uh, I pichai wish, i wish <laughs> I <don't>. everybody wants <laughs> but for every one sundar pichai there are 1 million people who are sitting on the benches yes. that people don't realize also in our country there is you know some things are looked down upon using your hands to do certain things for instance uh, you know a colleague of mine had gone for a one year fellowship uh, to germany and uh, his son was i think class 2 and uh, much of the time that the kids would be uh, in school they would be sent out to the playground to either do clay modeling or play with the mud so he was a little perplexed because this is not what he was doing in i think pathway school or wherever else he was going you know because there i think they were he was that much closer to quadratic <laughs> equations and trigonometry and here he is spending the whole day uh, in the playground you know doing this so he he said it's a waste of time what's he doing so he said no no we want our kids to use their hands they should know how to use their hands you know so which is what all of them were doing which was which was i thought a, a phenomenal uh, change in the way we look at education and progress uh, and the way uh, they see uh, he, there's another account of how he called a plumber home to fix a pipe and uh, he told me it's a work of art the way they do it they will put a, a sheet of paper all the way from the entrance of the house till the kitchen or bathroom or wherever they're going to do it so that when they walk on that and walk back uh, their shoes don't dirty your house you know and then they start the whole process and he said i i stood there mes- mesmerized he's also an engineer he is also from iit kadakpur and he's a mechanical engineer and he said i, I was uh, you know amazed seeing this that plumbing can be uh, can be an art like this and plumbers in germany uh, charge as much as doctors do you know just that there's no insurance so you have to pay uh, so you know those are some of the things that which are part of the rewiring that we as a society uh you as teachers have to do for kids that you teach you know uh and uh, and maybe all of us in our own professions perhaps uh, have to do yeah i'm not uh, completely disappointed with this i think 5 years back i mean if you go and look at some of the colleges or if you just look at the admissions mechanical admissions are getting better than electronics admissions in some of the colleges right it's just the time it's just the reflection of where the jobs are right and i think it's fair that students choose where they will get a better option right considering there are always limited jobs in any country etc right i think i'm not really worried about opting for not opting for mechanical etc i think that they will figure out right if they are passionate i know some of my best come i mean uh, ai entrepreneurs are from the mechanical branch and some of the best inter interdisciplinary engineering startups are done by computer science girls right so i think it's just a question of passion they'll figure out right so i'm not as uh, pessimistic about that or uh, this one and the first question that you had i just wanted to come back that iit to nit to coep to other college that you mentioned right if i got that uh, this one right i think again that's a reflection of where the jobs are right but what again i will come back to the second and third tier colleges and i will come back to the teachers in those colleges it's your chance to tell them now you lost one opportunity in your plus 2 but there are next 4 years right you can do some amazing work when you are in the when in next 4 years and then probably do better than iit if you just go and look at if you want to be an innovator there is a world is open right you can still go and do a great job right but what you need to do is you need to accept that you lost out on the plus 2 now you work hard spend more time 
and then do a better job, right? That's the role that teachers in the second and third year colleges have, and that's the role that management has, right? So uh, it's nothing to do with the students because they have to do what is right for them, right? So thank you so much. I think uh, with this we'll uh, we'll wrap up. That was a really engaging. Uh, discussion, a lot of food for thought. Uh, uh, you know, at least I'm. I have a lot of takeaways that I'm. Uh, I'm taking with me. So thanks again for 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 the panel. Uh, maybe a round of applause, and then we. Break. <laughs>